As a church, we feel called by God to do two big things, to grow active followers of Jesus Christ and to build his community. We talk about that a lot, and last week we talked about it as well, and we said that it's one thing to say that we have that mission as a church, but it's another thing to actually know how God is calling us to fulfill that mission. And we talked about how that mission is actually this adventurous journey that we get to go on as individuals and as a community together, and that that adventurous journey looks like something. Because we have talked to people who are experiencing the power of Jesus Christ in their lives here in our church and outside in the community, and the stories that we're telling to one another match this journey and we can see God at work and we want to join him in it. And so we've been praying together and listening to one another and we uh, believe that this journey is something that we're calling connect, grow, and love. We believe that God calls us to connect to one another in relationship, to connect in relationship to those outside the church. That's connect. We believe that God's calling us to grow closer and closer to Jesus Christ. And we believe that God is continuing to call us to carry out acts of love and service, not just to one another, but also to the community around us. God is working through that process of connecting, growing, and loving. He's changing lives. And we feel like when that happens, it's amazing. And so we want to join God in that and and, and let God use us to do that even more. It's a very exciting thing in the life of this church as we are called to this journey of connecting, growing, and loving. And so we talked about that whole journey last Sunday and affirmed it. And we also said that we see that pattern not only in the life of this congregation, but also in Scripture. We see it in many ways, but specifically In six chapters in the Gospel of Luke, when Jesus begins his ministry, we also see that entire pattern of connecting, growing, and loving in Luke 5 to 10. And so we did a big overview of Luke 5 to 10 last Sunday, and I said over and over again how those five chapters show us that pattern. And then after the worship service, our great finance elder Tom Kuskevier came up to me and he says, you know, it's six chapters, which it is. And I thought, man, it is so great that we have a finance elder who can count to six, (laughs) even though your pastor can't. But anyway, we've got six chapters where we see that pattern. and, And we talked about that last week. But today we're starting a brand new sermon series. And we're just going to be looking at the ways in which Jesus connects to people in those six, not five, chapters. And, uh, and we're doing that because when we look at this journey that we're on of connecting, growing, and loving, we feel like God has really blessed us and gifted us with, with the growing kinds of ministries that we do in, in worship and in Bible studies and giving, those kinds of things. We also feel like God is, has given us a passion for the acts of love that we feel called to do for one another and the world outside us. Now, we want to do more of that, but but we know God's given a, a, us a passion, a desire to do that. But when we look at the kinds of connections that we make, uh, we feel like that's kind of our growing area. That the connections we make with people in the world around us and even with one another could be stronger and we feel called to say let's focus on that for a season and dive into making these new connections even more and more and so we're going to just be looking at that over the the six chapters of Luke beginning in in chapter five we're not going to go in order but we're going to look at all of these amazing new and life-changing connections that Jesus Christ makes with people in those six chapters so we're focusing on connecting Uh, Jesus, by the way, doesn't call it connecting. He just starts building relationships with people, and he does call it something. If you remember, in the very beginning of these chapters, he calls it catching people. That's what he's doing by building these connections. And so today we're going to jump into seeing how Jesus makes those kinds of connections that are so amazing, so life-changing. And uh, we're going to start by reading... uh, 
uh, an encounter Jesus has with Pharisees while he's at a party. So uh, look up on the screen with me to Luke chapter 5, beginning at verse 33. Hear the word of God. Then they said to him, John's disciples, like the disciples of the Pharisees, frequently fast and pray, but your disciples eat and drink. Jesus said to them, You cannot make wedding guests fast while the bridegroom is with them, can you? The days will come when the bridegroom will be taken away from them, and then they will fast in those days. Also, he told them a parable. No one tears a piece from a new garment and sews it on an old garment. Otherwise, the new will be torn, and the piece from the new will not match the old. And no one puts new wine into old wineskins. Otherwise, the new wine will burst the skins and will be will burst the skins and will be spilled, and the skins will be destroyed. But new wine must also be put into fresh wineskins. And no one, after drinking old wine, desires new wine, but says the old is good. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. When we think about making new connections with people, just making a new friend or having a new relationship with people or maybe even just that moment of meeting somebody new, some of us might feel like that's a very easy thing. That just comes naturally to us. And others of us might feel like that's a very difficult thing to do because maybe we're more introverted or maybe we're more busy or we're stressed because of our schedule and so we feel like we don't have the time. And we have to admit that in our culture and in our setting, it's not always a safe thing to meet somebody new. We feel like it's, it's taking a risk in some way, either socially or intellectually or, or maybe even physically, to meet someone new, especially someone that we don't know or, or uh, maybe sets off some red flags for us or something like that. But, but there are moments when we feel like it's harder for us to make a new connection with somebody. And so when we read about Jesus just going out into the world and meeting all these new people and making all these new connections, for some of us, we might read that and feel like that's a very foreign thing to do. It's a very scary thing to do, but Jesus does it. And what's amazing is that as he does it, as he makes these connections, lives are changed. Small connections, big big connections, amazing things happen. And so if we want to be the kind of people who can engage and and make the kinds of new and life-changing connections that Jesus makes, we can really learn from Jesus' encounter with the Pharisees in Luke 5, 33 and following that we just read. Because we learn from that, uh, it's in a series of connections Jesus makes, and we learn from this moment, this uh, encounter that he has, some maybe strategies, but definitely some good practices and some good affirmations for us to enable, uh, to enable us to make those kinds of, of new and life-changing connections. And the first thing we see Jesus do in, in our text anyway, as he's making these connections, is that he, number one, is celebrating grace. He has just met this guy named Levi. We touched on this a little bit last week, but uh, he just met this guy named Levi. His name's also Matthew. You can call him Matthew, but Matthew is uh, uh, someone who uh, is a sinner and needs Jesus Christ desperately. And so Jesus reaches out to him. He builds this connection and it changes Matthew's life. And so you know what they do? They have a party. Matthew throws this banquet and Jesus comes and they're, they're celebrating this new connection that Jesus has with, with Matthew and all kinds of, of people are there. And as they're there, these leaders come. These are religious leaders who have authority and they're uh, 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 respected uh, leaders in the religious community. They come and they come up to Jesus and they say, you know... Uh, the disciples of John, and they're talking about John the Baptist, so this is a, another religious leader that, that uh, uh, ha- has come before Jesus, and, and they're referring to him, and they say, hey, the disciples of John, that means the people who follow John, they fast, 
and they pray. They do a lot of very rigid and religious things. And they also mention, hey, you know, our disciples, the, the followers of the Pharisees, these religious leaders, also fast and pray. These are people who are very, um, very uh, rigid, very stringent leaders, and they're starchy and stiff and judgmental, and they come and they confront Jesus at this party. If you can imagine being at a party, and then this conflict happens, and everybody looks, what's going on? And the Pharisees say, hey, they all fast and pray, and then they say, why is it that your followers do not fast and pray? Why is it that your followers are eating and drinking and having this party? That doesn't make any sense to us. It reminds me, actually, of a conversation I had at another church a long time ago. I think a lot of churches had this conversation probably 20 years ago or so. Brett Hamblin did, too, at, at a certain point. And um, I think we're, we're well beyond this. I don't think churches have this kind of conversation as much anymore. But I was at a church 20 years ago or so that we had this conversation about would we allow coffee in the sanctuary? Very important conversation, right? And in the Pacific Northwest, I think that's kind of a no-brainer. We all carry coffee. Um, now, if you've got coffee, feel good about yourself. It's fine that you have coffee in here. But, uh, um, you know, we, we carry that wherever we go. Uh, it's even allowed in the library these days. You can just bring it anywhere uh, you want. And we had this serious conversation about how, you know, should we protect the, the space from coffee? Um, what if it stains the carpet and all of this kind of stuff? And, and it just struck me that it, rem it, it was so much like this conversation that Jesus has with the Pharisees. The Pharisees want to um, encourage this, this rigid and highly religious sort of structure, but Jesus is having a party at this time, and, and people are eating and drinking, and they're having this amazing time, and, but this, this is not for no reason. They're having this amazing time because the grace of Jesus has come to Levi. Jesus has made this connection with a sinner and they're celebrating. They're celebrating the grace that has come. And so, of course, they're, they're having a party. It just makes sense. And Jesus' response to them is amazing. He says, you don't fast when the bridegroom is with you, do you? He's likening what has happened to this big marriage festival. There's been a, a connection that's made, and that's not a time for fasting. That's a time for celebrating because the grace of Jesus Christ has come. If we're hesitant to make these new connections, these kinds of connections in our lives that Jesus makes in these, in these texts, if we're hesitant to do that, the first step is so easy. It's not even about getting out there or trying hard or anything like that. The first step is just to celebrate grace. Just to say, gosh, the, the grace of Jesus has come into my life and I'm going to celebrate. I'm going to let go of, of some of the, the, the stodginess and the things that hold me back and I'm just absolutely going to celebrate. It's not a chore. It's not a, a duty to make a new connection. It, it, we do it with, with joy. So if we lack the motivation to make new connections or we lack the interest in it, the first step is just to celebrate the grace that we have encountered through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Now, if we're an introvert or um, maybe we're busy in our lives and I, I just kind of wonder about that and I want to say that as we look at these connections that Jesus makes, we can take some comfort in the fact that there's nothing in the text about how frequent these relationships need to be. There's nothing in the text about how big they need to be. In fact, some of these connections are very small. They're very quiet. But what's important about them is that they are new. And they are, they are life-changing. And so we celebrate. Jesus tells a, a parable in a little bit about putting new wine into old wineskins and the old wineskins would burst if you did that. And this isn't exactly his point. We'll talk about his point in a moment. But, but we can envision that, that grace coming into our lives and, and us bursting with celebration and, and joy because we celebrate grace. And that's this first step to creating these new relationships. And then another thing we learn about how we can make new relationships in our life in this text actually comes right before our text. 
Just before our text, the, the Pharisees are questioning Jesus even more, and Jesus has this line where he says, you know, I have come to call not the righteous, but sinners. He has just said that, and then this is what happens, what we just read. And so that's the point of what Jesus is talking about. He is at this party with a bunch of, of sinners, and these are the people who he has called to be in relationship with him. In chapters 5 and 6, just in these two chapters, we have Jesus making connection after connection after connection. And there is this, this pattern to these connections. First, he connects with Peter, James, and John, and then he connects with a, with a, a, a leper, and then he uh, connects with a paralytic, and then he has this connection with Levi or Matthew. And after that connection with Levi or Matthew, he's got these encounters with the Pharisees, and we're reading about the second one. And then he goes on and makes more connections. He's got a connection with a man with a withered hand, and then he makes a connection with these 12 disciples that he calls to, to serve him. And so we have this pattern, this like arc in these two chapters, and right in the middle of the arc is Levi. Jesus says, I've come to call not the righteous, but sinners. And then he makes this connection with Levi. And this connection with Levi or Matthew is the example of what Jesus is doing because Levi, Matthew, is a tax collector who in this cultural setting is, a, is an enemy collaborator, not the sort of person you want to hang out with, not the sort of person whose house you want to go to, not the kind of person you want to be seen with at a party. And this is exactly who Jesus is making this connection with. And it's appalling to the Pharisees who then confront him because it is not acceptable to religious leaders that Jesus Christ would have a relationship, a connection with someone like Matthew but Jesus has come to call sinners, not the righteous. Now think for a minute. Think of someone in your life right now. Just think of that person. Who is someone that you would be hesitant to make a new connection with? Who is someone in your life that you don't want to make a connection with? Someone that you might think you would never be connected with. And consider for a moment that maybe that is the person that God is calling you to make a connection with. Now, there are a lot of reasons we might have for saying that we don't want to be connected with someone. Could be economic kind of class reasons. Could be a reason that has something to do with education level. Could be something that has to do with politics in this day and age could be something that has to do with religion, could even be something that has to do with race or any other number of walls that we build that seem to separate us from people and make us not want to connect with other people. Well, the point here is that Jesus is breaking down all of those all the way through the category of, of sinner even. Who is it that you would not make a connection with? And is it possible that that is the very person God is calling you to connect with? And then as we read on, we discover that another way that Jesus is, is making these new and life-changing connections is by embracing the new mission that Jesus has. That people who embrace that mission are, in, are able to make these new connections better. Jesus as he makes these new connections, is actually carrying out a brand new mission. So he tells these two parables. First, he talks about this uh, uh, new garment, and he says, you know, no one would take a piece of a new garment and then sold it, uh, sew it on an old garment. You wouldn't do that because it would tear off, and also it would look terrible. And then he tells the same parable again in, uh, with different different imagery. He says, also, no one takes new wine and pours it into new wineskins, because if they did that, the wineskin would, would burst. It would, it would break open. You, you just, you wouldn't do that. Now, the new wine, the new garment is the grace of Jesus Christ. That's the new thing that has come into the world. And it needs a new wineskin to hold it. And that new wineskin is the church. 
that new wineskin is the connections that Jesus is building right here in these six chapters. As he's going through and meeting people, he's building this connectional network, and that network is going to become the church. That network is going to become the new wineskin that is, is needed. And so something completely new has come. And the fact that this thing that has come, this grace of Jesus Christ has come, the fact that that, that, that grace and sharing that grace as a mission has come, the fact that that is, is so new changes everything. It changes how we are able to connect with people because there's just nothing like it at all. How many of you uh, have an iPhone? Raise your hand, some of you. Don't be shy. You can admit it. I'm an Android guy, so I don't have an iPhone. I have had iPhones, though. And, uh, um, and, so, and, and, and I've gone back and forth. But do you remember back in 2007 when the first new iPhone came out? It was such a big deal. The phone didn't do as much as some other smartphones at the time, but it was beautiful and you could interact with it differently. And for whatever reason, I think it had more to do with Apple's marketing than anything else. We felt like it was this absolutely brand new thing that we'd never seen before. And do you remember people like formed these lines and they went around and they'd, they'd camp out in tents to just get this new phone that was coming out. And then the following year, maybe it was two years later, I don't know, now it's every single year, I don't remember what it was back then, but a new phone would come out and the hype would go on again and the first few years that it came out, the phone was so much better and so different, it felt completely brand new again. And the lines would form and the tents would form and people would get all excited about it and, and then the, the, the iPad came out and, and people didn't even know what that thing did, but they were so excited for it that they would camp out and I remember I was in Seattle one week during one of those many launches. It's been so many years now, and I didn't want to go, but I did want to kind of see the spectacle. So I remember walking by the Apple store in, in Seattle and seeing all of the people camping out. It was just, it was wild. And that just went on every year. It's this brand new thing. Well, did you know that last week Apple launched another new iPhone? I'll bet some of you didn't even know that. And all it was, and there was still some hype, but it's nothing like the hype that it used to be. And all that's different this year, it looks the same, it does the same thing, it's a little faster, maybe the battery lasts a little longer, the screens are the same. Uh, there's just some very small tweaks and that's all it is. Apple wants to help it make us think that it's new every year, but that's the best they can do this year. It's, they're running out of steam. <laughs> but what if there was something that was so new that it was new every year and it was always new and there would, nothing, there would never be anything that would ever be newer. That's the newness that Jesus is talking about when he's talking about new wine and, and a new garment. He is bringing the grace of Christ into something, into the world, into old religion. He is bringing new grace that is always new. And the fact that it is always new changes the way we connect with people. Because it's about grace and because these connections are not like any other connections. This, this newness that Jesus is bringing, it's not just like another step in, say, Judaism. That's the religion of the Pharisees. It's not just, just continuing. It's a new thing. There's never been anything like it. And acknowledging that and knowing that enables us to have these connections that we just couldn't have otherwise. And so, and so we, we, we connect with sinners, we celebrate grace, we affirm how new the mission Jesus gives us is. And as we do that, we build these new connections. And then finally, as we read in this text, uh, there's this really interesting uh, addition that Luke gives us. This parable, this encounter, you know, it's written in Matthew, it's written in Mark as well, and then Luke records it as... As well, he has these the parables, the 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 uh, the garment, the old and new garment, the the wine, all that kind of thing. And then Luke adds this little aside that no one else adds. And I'm so glad he does because when you read through this, you kind of have this question anyway because the parable doesn't entirely hold up. Like we get it, okay? There's there's new wine and there's this old wine skin, and you can't do that. You got to have a, a new wine skin with new wine. 
And the point there is how great the gospel is, how new it is, and how much we should celebrate it, and that's great. And we understand that is the point, especially because we have this other parable that says the same thing about the garment, and certainly new garments are better than old garments. But the more we think about it, we start scratching our head because we say, okay, but wait a minute, old wine is better. Nobody wants to drink new wine when old wine is available. And so Luke adds this little aside and he says, and no one after drinking old wine desires new wine. They say the old is good. It takes change. It takes work. It takes uh, motivation for us to let go of our preference for the old. The Pharisees are unwilling to do that. They come to Jesus and they talk about fasting and other kinds of religious uh, principles, and they are afraid of the new. What Jesus is bringing is so alarming and concerning to them because they prefer the old. Now, Luke is not abandoning Judaism Luke, in fact, in other places, affirms Judaism, and, and one of the other gospel writers talk about how, how both the old and the new are good, and, and Luke isn't saying that the old is bad. Luke is just saying that the new is way better, that Jesus is bringing something way better. But when we hang on to our preferences for the old, that can get in the way of us making new and life-changing connections. We have to let go of our preference for the old. This week, I, I read a, um, a, a story about this uh, herd of deer who have been living on the border between Germany and uh, the, the Czech Republic. And they've lived there for forever. Uh, but during the Cold War, when we had the Iron Curtain, which, you know, was this metaphor that divided East and West uh, uh, Europe, but... Uh, not only was it a metaphor, in many places there was actually a physical barrier. And this, this forest between these two nations was one of those places where there was a physical barrier. There was a fence and there were guard towers and it went right through this beautiful area where these deer lived. And so these deer lived with this fence that they could not cross forever and ever. And now the fence is gone. It's been gone since the late 80s. But the deer still will not cross the boundary. This one giant herd of deer has been divided into two, and now they live separately. Biologists have tracked them. They've put GPS collars on them. They tracked one deer 11,000 times and watched this deer go up and down and, and never, ever cross the boundary, even though they surely did before that boundary went up. And now there's this beautiful nature preserve on one side of the boundary. And the deer who live on that side of the boundary have this amazing experience, an amazing place to live, but the deer on the other side never go there. And some geologists think that it's because they have like this genetic memory of, of, of uh, you know, that gets passed down, from, I mean, from generation to generation so that they learn these, these hunting trails uh, and, they, and they, they never cross. Uh, but a filmmaker who's visited this area and is making a documentary about it says that the walls are still in the brains of the deer and they will not cross. What are those old things that we want to hang on to that might get in the way of new connections, new relationships? What are those walls that are in our, our brains that, that we can't let go of? Because we've got to, if, if it's a preference, we can, we can let go of that preference for the old thing and we can embrace the new thing because the new thing is way better. The new thing is the grace of Jesus Christ. What are the walls that keep us from doing that? Today, as we think about making these new connections, what that might look like, who we might connect with, I want to encourage you, and we're going to do this every Sunday for the next few weeks, I want to encourage you to think of someone that God is actually calling you to make a new connection with. Now, I'm not necessarily talking about evangelism in the way that we have in the past used the word evangelism. I'm not talking about 
uh, converting people, whatever, whatever old thing that might be holding you back from a new connection. I'm not necessarily talking about that sort of thing. We leave that up to Jesus Christ. But Jesus makes these connections, and so can we. We make these connections by, by celebrating grace, by, by welcoming sinners, by just like ourselves, by, um, by, by, by uh, 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 embracing the new mission of Jesus Christ and, and by giving up our preference for the old. Who is it that you can make a connection with in that way? I want to invite you to think of that person. Now, over there, under the window, we've got our little worship station, and there are five candles sitting on the table there. Some of you can see them. If you can't see them, use your imagination. It's just five candles on a table. Not a big deal. Um, What we're going to be doing is um, next Sunday, if you have thought of someone that you feel called to make a new connection with, we're going to just pray for that person. We're not going to pray for them by name. You don't have to share their name or anything, but come into the sanctuary and light one of those candles for them. If all five are lit, we'll know there's more. And if none of them are lit, we'll just let that convict us. And that's fine. But think of someone that God is calling you to make a new connection with. We'll light a candle for them and we'll pray for them. And let's pray together right now.